happy to welcome you and kick off today's event, Banding Together in the Fight Against Human Trafficking. It's part of AHA's Hospitals Against Violence virtual series on combating human trafficking. This series is co-hosted with our partners, the Jones Day Law Firm and Heal Trafficking. Joining me today is Kurt Kirshner, who's a partner at Jones Day, and Dr. George Askew, the president of Heal Trafficking. You'll hear from both of them today and actually shortly. To learn more about the AHA Jones Day and Heal Partnership and find other helpful resources and tools, my colleagues will be adding links to the chat box, so be sure to look there. You may also, you may also want to submit comments and questions in the chat box and our team will be happy to assist you. Today's program is intended for health professionals and it will provide you with useful, a useful understanding of how to identify, assess, and respond to human trafficking. To help us do that, we'll hear from Jose Alfaro, a sex tra trafficking survivor who you may have heard interviewed recently on NPR's Morning Edition um, on their May 24th program. I also want to take a moment to thank all of our other speakers that you'll hear from. We very much appreciate them being with us today and look forward to their contributions. One other special feature of today's program is a live and extremely cool illustrator, Matt Orley of Big Paper Strategy. He's a visual storyteller and he promises to weave our discussions together into helpful takeaways for visual learners that I think will both delight and amaze us. And to help us bring all this together, Mary Beth Kingston, an AHA board member, the Chief Nursing Officer of Advocate Aurora Health, and Chair of the Hospitals Against Violence Advisory Group, will walk us through these different illustrations. Now it's my pleasure to hand it over to Kurt Kirshner. Kurt. Thank you, Mindy, um, and welcome everyone. As Mindy mentioned, I'm a partner with the Jones Day Law Firm. Uh, we're proud to work together with the AHA and Heal Trafficking in sponsoring this convening. Since the launch of our Anti-Human Trafficking Task Force five years ago, Jones Day has marshaled a coordinated global effort to combat both labor and sex trafficking, while also providing justice for survivors. Um, Jones Day's litigation teams have represented a significant number of trafficking victims in criminal restitution and expungement matters. An important component of our pro bono related, trafficking related work in the area I've been most involved in has been in the healthcare field in partnership with the HA in heal trafficking. For example, we published a tool to help healthcare providers understand the reporting and educational obligations relating to anti-human trafficking activities. And if you look in your chat yeah. box, you can see a link to that tool. It's available to uh, one and all who want to use it. And we encourage you to, uh, to uh, use that resource if it's of value to you. The work of our task force extends beyond healthcare and is truly multidisciplinary and global. And we're thrilled to partner and assist workshops like these uh, to help healthcare providers develop and enhance their anti trafficking programs across the country. And with that, I'll turn it over to our partner um, at Heal Trafficking, Dr. George Askew. Thank you and good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. George Askew. As president of the board of directors of Heal Trafficking, I, I, want, I want you to know just how proud Heal is to be co-hosting this event. I was so excited to see the response to the event, and it's great to see so many of you here. Human trafficking awareness actually came to me late in my clinical professional career. After two decades, of over two decades actually, as a practicing pediatrician, mm. I had the opportunity when serving as the chief medical officer for the Administration for Children and Families, when I was asked by the Secretary of Health to represent Health and Human Services on the working group putting together the Federal Strategic Action Plan on Services for Victims of Human Trafficking in the United States. This led to the development of the SOAR training, which I was able to participate in, and that was put together in recognition that individuals who have experienced trafficking often I say very often come into contact with healthcare and social and social service professionals during and after their exploitation. 
but still remain largely unidentified. It was during this work that I recognized that to that point in my healthcare career, I had probably encountered numerous individuals who had a trafficking, who had had trafficking experience, but didn't recognize it. You know, from the team boy with a barcode on his forearm uh, to the nanny from parts unknown who sat silently in the corner while I examined the two-year-old she was in charge of caring for, perhaps not of her own will, I was not equipped with the tools, knowledge, and understanding of human trafficking to make a difference. I have since made human trafficking education of my health and human services staff and my primary work as a government official over the last decade, a cornerstone of my professional leadership efforts. And of course, in my work as a volunteer with HEAL. HEAL Trafficking's vision is a world healed of trafficking. HEAL standard setting resources for health professionals on trafficking are being used in 35 countries around the world. The resources include our HEAL protocol toolkit, HEAL curriculum assessment tool, core competencies, and our training the trainers program. To the nurses, doctors, mid-level, social workers, administrators, uh, all of you who are tuning in today, thank you for, your, for participating. What you do matters tremendously. Your work is life-saving and life-altering, but you don't have to take my word for it. You'll hear about the real difference you can make in the lives of trafficking survivors like Jose, who, who you'll hear from next. But first, back to you, Dr. Staklosa, or to you, Dr. Staklosa. Thanks so much, everyone, for that wonderful welcome. And I would be remiss not to include a trigger warning um, right now as we open up today's session. So today's session may contain potentially triggering material. We want this to be a safe space for you. So please take care of yourself in the ways that you need to. So I'm very pleased to introduce Jose Luis Alfaro. He is a human trafficking survivor, public speaker, author, advocate, and activist. He has worked with several anti-human trafficking organizations worldwide to spread awareness on trafficking, specifically within the LGBTQ plus community. Jose is currently working on a memoir depicting his own personal experiences with trafficking. He has been featured in several publications and we heard most recently um, his NPR uh, radio uh, bit and has worked with law enforcement, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice, to name a few. And he also serves as a member of the Human Trafficking Legal Center Advisory Committee. Jose's work includes public speaking and giving lectures, sharing his story and statistics of human trafficking. So without any further ado, I'm pleased to hand it over to Jose Alfaro. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for that incredible introduction, Hani. And also thank you all for having me today. I, um, I still don't see myself as this person that everyone says that I am. I still think that I'm coming to terms with identifying as a survivor um, because some days I still feel like I'm, I'm still surviving, right? I'm still getting through all of the um, horrible moments that I went through. I also for a long time didn't know that what happened to me was human trafficking. So I couldn't identify as that, which is why I share my story today so that I could help others identify as victims or survivors. Now, I know that Hani already gave a trigger warning, but I do wanna give my own. I, it is not my intention to trigger anyone, um, but it's more so to provide awareness and education so that people can better understand how this happens. Um, there's a few different things that I want to include with sharing my story with you today. I will point out the vulnerabilities, the grooming process, and also the effects that human trafficking had on me. <clears throat> so my story begins in 2006 when my parents kicked me out of my home because of my sexuality. And I grew up in a conservative town where being gay was an abomination. So from an early age, I was silent. And I felt as though I couldn't share that with anyone. And so I had to keep it to myself. And so when my parents went through my phone and they asked me if I was gay, they also asked me 
how are they going to fix me? And my response was, move me somewhere new where I can start over. And I promise you that I will change. And my parents bought it. And deep down inside, I actually thought that I could change myself. But unfortunately, my parents moved me to a very large city, much larger than the small town that I grew up in. And I met other people like me. And I began to feel normal and feel like it was okay to be who I was. And it's during that time that I end up coming in contact with a 36 year old man who then begins sexually abusing me while I'm away from home. Now, during this time, I end up coming home for the summer. And as soon as I get home, my father confronts me. And I thought that because of the relationship that I had with the 36 year old man, that he was then going to be there to protect me and to help me. And so I felt it was best to tell my father that this is who I am and that I cannot change. And my father immediately gave me an ultimatum. He said, either you're going to conversion therapy camp, you're going to therapy and you're going to change, you're going to church, or you need to get out of my house. And I already knew a little bit about conversion therapy camp. And as much as I contemplated it, thinking that maybe I did need to change, I made the decision to go with the 36 year old. And with a 36 year old, we contacted an attorney and the attorney advised us that I would not be considered a runaway and I would not get in trouble if I took a few steps. And a few of those steps were to claim myself homeless where they then provided me with a legal guardian to help enroll me into school without the help of my parents and then make sure that I'm attending school. And that's what I did. They did not check into where I was living, how I was living, and who I was living with. They basically just signed the papers that I needed them to sign, um, which I think easily anyone could have stepped in and helped at any moment. Um, now, once I was living with a 36-year-old, I was basically living a life on my own. The 36-year-old took advantage of me. He was sexually abusing me multiple times a day. And I thought this was normal. I thought this is what I was supposed to do. You know, he's providing me a place to stay. He's helping me. In my mind, this was okay. And eventually it wasn't until I realized that he was sleeping with other teenagers that I realized that this was a problem and I wanted to leave. And so I went back home with my parents and my father confronted me again, decided to fight with me and kicked me out. And so I end up at a friend's place and I end up on a gay chat site named gay.com. And I meet a man named Jason Gandy. Now, before I go too far into the grooming process, I want to highlight some of the vulnerabilities that I was showing at the time. How was I vulnerable to Jason Gandy in that moment? One, I was homeless. Homeless youth are at the top of the list for predators. Two, I am gay. The LGBTQ community is a vulnerable population to being trafficked, either through survival sex or homelessness due to homophobia and transphobia. I am Latino, which people of color and communities that are underserved are number one on the list of vulnerable communities. So those are just some of the few vulnerabilities, but those were the ones that I identified with through my story. Um, now, going back to the grooming process, I think this is an important part of trafficking and people's stories is understanding how I, or how the trafficker groomed me and how he got me to go with him and do what he asked. Now, when I began speaking with Jason Gandy, he asked me how my day was going. And immediately I became the perfect victim for him. I was targeted because of the color of my skin, my age and my sexuality. Jason knew exactly who to target. And within minutes, he found me. 
Once I felt that I could no longer go through with the abuse, sorry. Um, once I made the decision to go with him, um, Jason asked me how my day was going. He immediately shared what had occurred that day. And I said that I didn't know what I was going to do. Jason showed me empathy. He told me that he had friends who had been kicked out from their home and that he felt that he needed to help me. He painted this big picture for me that he, had, that he was wealthy. He had a nine bedroom home in Austin, Texas. He shared that he wanted to help me and that he felt that he needed to. And I spoke with him for over two hours and he just painted this amazing life. And it was much better than the life that I was living previously. And I also had no other options. Where was I gonna go? I couldn't share with anyone about my sexuality. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know of any organizations. I didn't know of any resources. All I knew was I needed to survive. And he painted a picture that seemed like the only way. And it sounded incredible. And so once I made the decision to go with him, the first week with him was great. It was normal. And then he began to introduce the idea of massage therapy. And he began massaging me in nude and basically telling me that this was normal, that this was okay, that we have the same body parts, that we are human beings and it's okay to be naked around each other. He then began to sexually abuse me as well. And with my previous relationship, I again, thought that this was normal and something that I had to give them in return of the help that they were giving me. So after he introduced the idea of massage, he then began controlling my diet and he created a routine. And the routine was healthy eating, very, very clean eating. And if you know any teenager, healthy eating is not something that, that they wanna do. So it's something that I was not interested in. And I wanted things like Doritos and um, Gatorade and, you know, sugary and unhealthy substances, but he would not allow me to have any of it. He then began making me go to the gym twice a day, every single day. And then he told me one day, you're going to want to live a life on your own and you're going to want to support yourself. And he said, and I know the perfect way. He said, I run a massage business and I think it'd be a great idea if you worked with me in my massage business. Now, the problem with that is, is that I thought that I wouldn't be able to give a massage because I wasn't trained to. And so I said, like, I don't think this is a good idea. I don't know how to do it. And he said, that's the easy part. He said, we will be giving forehand massages and I will be in the room with you and you just do as I do. And immediately I said, okay, this is all that I ever wanted. I wanted to live a life on my own. I wanted to be myself and I wanted to support myself. And so I was willing to do what he asked of me. And so then he says, there's one problem. And the problem is, is that you're under the age of 18. And because you're under the age of 18, if anyone finds out, you could get into a lot of trouble. So immediately, Again, I'm silent. I cannot share with anyone what I'm about to endure. And so he already put that in my mind and we go into our first massage and there were a few things that went through my mind at that time. And it was, if I say no, that I do not wanna do this, is Jason going to tie me down, lock me in a room? Is he going to bite me, hurt me in any kind of way. If I say that I don't wanna do this while the client is in the room, is the client going to stop me? Is the client going to hurt me or worse, even murder me? And three, where am I gonna go? I have nowhere else to go. So in that moment, I'm trapped as it is. And I feel like this is all, this is the only choice that I have. And this is what I have to go through with. As the massages continued, they began to get worse and worse. 
they began to get more and more aggressive. It went from fondling me to oral sex and then to full on rape. And these massages were happening multiple times a day for several months. And it got to a point to where I had had enough and I couldn't deal with it anymore. And I thought that my best option was to plan my escape and, and leave with a 36 year old again. So at this moment, I don't realize it, but I had changed. I had changed tremendously. I was no longer the young, driven, happy young man that I was before. I was angry, I was depressed, and I hated my life. I began experiencing moments of PTSD. Um, my heart would race anytime I felt triggered, and my, my anxiety would be to the roof. I felt like many moments where I felt like I was going to die um, just from the heart racing, and I felt like I couldn't breathe. I didn't know what any of it meant at the time, but I could feel my body reacting. I would shake like uncontrollably. And I felt like something was wrong with me, but as soon as it would calm down, I just ignored it. And it just kept happening every single time that I felt like the same thing was gonna happen to me again. There were many nights that I used alcohol and drugs to cope. Um, I contemplated suicide many times and I could no longer hold a job. I, after, as time went on, I did graduate from high school. Um, but when I was in college, I had to drop out because I was drinking way too much. I was partying. I was super depressed. I was not waking up on time. And at the same time, I'm not even realizing why I'm feeling the way that I am. And a lot of this, I'm just blaming my parents. I'm not even blaming the idea of what happened to me with Jason or what happened to me with the 36 year old. I'm just thinking like, Something happened to me and this is how I am. And I don't know why I'm not driven and why I don't wanna be anyone anymore. So in 2012, I moved to Boston, Massachusetts through a sugar daddy. I was doing sex work for a number of years to survive. And the only way that I could survive was by doing the massages and the trade that I learned from Jason. And it did help me. It helped me to provide for myself. It helped me to eat, to sleep. And it was a job, it was a business. And that's what I did for a very long time. And it helped me make it from night to night. The only problem with this is that there were many moments where I probably should have gone to a doctor, but it wasn't that I was afraid to go and see a doctor. I think the biggest thing for me was I didn't know how. I didn't know how to book an appointment. I didn't know how to, I didn't know which doctor to call. I didn't know anything about insurance. I didn't have the resources or the tools to do any of it. So I just ignored it. So I went years and years without seeing a doctor because I didn't know how. So once I moved to Boston in 2012 um, through a sugar daddy and sugar ba baby relationship, after a few months, I ended up meeting my current boyfriend, David. And I enrolled into beauty school and slowed down my drinking habit a little bit. And I got a job as a receptionist at a salon. And it was the first time that, that I made my first paycheck. And this was a time that I left the sex work and I started to feel like, okay, this is something that I can do. And I started to feel that drive come back and that feeling like I wanna be somebody and I wanna do something with my life. Once I moved in with David, the drinking began more frequently. And the drinking began more frequently because now I'm living with someone who I'm supposed to trust. And I had really, really bad trust issues. I could no longer trust anyone. And I felt very triggered by anything that he did. I remember times where he would leave the apartment and I would search through the entire apartment to see if there were any signs that he was cheating on me, to see if there were any signs that maybe he was a pedophile, to see if there were any signs that he could end up putting me in a situation of danger. And I, it takes a lot out of you when you are going through every drawer 
the closet, searching under the bed, searching through the laptop, through the phone, whatever it is that you can get your hands on, because you need to make sure that you're safe. And this created a lot of mental problems for me. And I began becoming very violent. I was very angry. I was extremely depressed. And again, I began contemplating suicide and I started using alcohol and drugs again to cope. As time went on, about a year later, I had a major anxiety attack and it was so major that I was bedridden for two weeks. I could not leave my bed. And I know now that the anxiety caused agoraphobia where I could not leave, I could not move. And any time that I did, again, my body would shake. I felt extremely anxious and I didn't know what was wrong with me. I didn't know what to do. I felt like I was gonna vomit. I felt like I was gonna pass out. And worst of all, there were many moments where I felt like I was gonna die and this was it. And it wasn't until at the end of the two weeks, I woke up with a mouth full of blood where I had chewed both sides of my tongue. And I figured I need to go and see a doctor and I need to get help. And so I went to the doctor and the doctor told me that I had extreme PTSD, anxiety, depression, and that I was experiencing, um, I was grinding my teeth at night, which caused me to chew both sides of my tongue due to all of the stress that I was going through. And so once I had a better understanding of what was going on with me, I, I then began making steps to better myself. Um, before I go into the steps that I did to better myself, I do wanna talk a little bit about a few points um, that can help healthcare professionals when a survivor comes in and is experiencing things like PTSD and anxiety. First of all, um, patients do not understand why they are experiencing the symptoms that they are having. If I had a better understanding, I probably would have gotten help much, much sooner. Number two, it is important for healthcare professionals to understand the reason for PTSD, and it's important to get an accurate history of the patient. Number three, seek the appropriate help for the patient. I immediately was placed on antidepressants. I actually think that I should have gone to therapy much, much sooner, um, but that was not really kind of pushed for. The first thing was just medication, and that wasn't something that I wanted to do, and there were many moments where I was still drinking and taking the medication at the exact same time, and so it put me in situations to where I was, again, acting violently and acting erratic, and a lot of friends said that I was toxic, that they didn't want to be around me anymore. And I would go to um, work where I was still drunk and still hungover and still acting erratic. And so I needed someone to tell me how to cope, how to deal, and how to move forward with my life. Um, and number four, show the patient empathy rather than just writing them off as just another drunk or alcoholic or a troubled person. I think there were many times where I felt like people were judging me and I felt judged my whole life. And I didn't know why, I didn't know what was wrong with me. Why am I acting out? Why am I behaving this way? And today I wanna to say that I'm so thankful for that two week panic attack, which I don't know anyone who would say that, but I do truly feel that way. I, that anxiety attack changed my life. It truly did. It really helped me to take the steps to make the changes in my life so that I could better myself. And I started to listen to my body. And I started to listen to my body because I had to. I couldn't go drinking anymore. I couldn't go to the bars without having a, an anxiety attack. I couldn't, I could barely go to work. And so I was constantly going from work to home, work to home, work to home. And I had some time to really just listen to what it is that I needed to move forward. And I started going to the gym and I started eating better. I started eating healthier. 
I started drinking a ton more water, which water today is like my lifesaver. Um, and it really changed my life. So like I said, I'm so thankful for my two week long anxiety attack. Um, but now that I kind of went through a little bit of the aftermath and the effects of trafficking, I wanna end this on a more positive note. And I want to share that in 2014, I had a friend come and visit me from Houston, Texas. And he shared with me that Jason Gandy was arrested in London with a 15 year old boy. And he was trafficking him through his massage business exactly how he did to me. And long story short, four others came forward. And Jason Gandy was sentenced to 30 years in prison with no chance of parole. All four victims, including myself, testified in this trial. And then I had a civil suit against Jason Gandy, and I won my civil suit and was granted 1.43 million. I will probably never see this money, um, but it is a piece of paper that helps validate me and my story, and it's really helped me to move forward with my life. Another few things that have helped me move forward is writing, sharing my story, it's really helped me to analyze all of the moments in my life where I felt like I was to blame, where I felt like something was wrong with me. And now as an adult, I'm able to see that it wasn't me and that there were people who did things that were wrong, but also I'm able to forgive those people because now I have an understanding of why and maybe, and I have an understanding of why they did it to me, why my parents kicked me out why they felt the way that they did. And with that understanding, I'm able to forgive them and I'm open to having a relationship with my parents in the future. And so, yeah, that's basically where I'm at today. And I will continue to share. I will continue to spread awareness. And it really has just changed my life being able to come on platforms like this and let everyone know how it's happening and as many people that I can save or help, that's, that's what I'm gonna keep doing. So I'd like to pass it off to, back to Hani, I believe. Um, but thank you again for having me. And yeah, I'll pass the mic. Big round of applause um, for Jose. And I just, um, Jose, there's lots of love in the chat too there. So you should, um, you should <laughs> check that out. Um, but I really appreciate your utter vulnerability um, and and sharing the vulnerabilities to trafficking that were part of your your journey, the color of your skin, your sexual orientation, your gender, um, and these are so eye opening to us health professionals. Um, and thank you for reminding us not just to see the medical or the mental health diagnosis or the substance use, but to really be curious about and to see the underlying cause. Um, and that simple acts of empathy can be just so impactful. So thank you again um, for, for sharing with us today. Um, I'm now uh, pleased to introduce Dr. Wendy Macias Constantopoulos. All of our speakers' full bios have been shared with the participants um, in the final agenda. Many of you may not know that Dr. Macias Constantopoulos was my attending as I trained in emergency medicine and was an early mentor in my work on trafficking. She's a director of the Center for Social Justice and Health Equity, founding executive director of MGH Freedom Clinic, and associate professor of emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School. And we're really pleased to have her today to share with us about dispelling misconceptions. We know that many misconceptions plague anti-trafficking efforts, including healthcare-based anti-trafficking efforts. So over to you, Dr. Macias Constantopoulos. Thank you so much, Dr. Saklosa. I am pleased to be here with all of you today. And uh, Jose, thank you for being so courageous and so open um, about your experiences. You really are making a difference. And when others hear what you've been through, it, it uh, helps us to understand how we can do better. Um, and so with that, you would, have th you would have thought that Jose and I coordinated more than we actually did, um, but I am going to talk today about some misconceptions that plague um, anti-trafficking work and that specifically show up um, a fair amount in the healthcare industry. 
Um, so first and foremost, we'll just take this very broadly. Um, the first misconception is that this is not occurring in the United States. Mo a lot of people think of this as something that is occurring abroad in the developing world, not here in the United States. If it does occur here in the United States, it only impacts foreign born nationals. Um, there's no way that US citizens could be impacted by this. Um, and we clearly know that that's not true. We know that it impacts certainly immigrants, our vulnerable population, but it also impacts people of color. Uh, people with disabilities, um, youth who are homeless specifically, um, and youth who unfortunately end up getting involved in gangs. So this is really something that can happen to anyone. It definitely doesn't just involve foreign born nationals. Um, next, there's this misconception that um, human trafficking equates to commercial sexual exploitation or sex trafficking. Um, we tend to think about human trafficking here in the United States in terms of sex trafficking. Um, and we sometimes fail to see that there's this other portion, um, labor trafficking, that is also part of the picture. And in fact, research has shown that labor trafficking is probably more uh, prevalent than um, sex trafficking. Although I will say that with a grain of salt, uh, because we don't have clearly accurate numbers. This, as you can imagine, is a very difficult um, problem to quantify. Um, but here in the United States, we are bombarded through the news, through social media, um, through Hollywood movies, with images and with um, uh, sort of profiles of trafficking that um, are strictly related to sex trafficking. Our labor trafficking um, uh, problem here in the United States is unfortunately caught up in immigration policies and political discourse. And so we tend not to pay as much attention to labor trafficking um, as we do to commercial sex uh, trafficking. Um, the other misconception is that this always involves some form of physical restraint, force, or bondage. And we tend to think of that because we see the Hollywood images, we see the documentaries of the most extreme cases. And while those cases do exist, there are cases where extreme physical restraint, somebody being tied up to the radiator, locked up in a closet, put behind um, you know, barred windows and locked doors, while those cases do exist, that is not the majority. And if we think about that as being um, trafficking, we're going to miss all the other cases of trafficking that move and live among us, right? All these individuals who unfortunately are being trafficked move in and out of our society and the same buildings that you and I move in and out of. And so we need to be alert and aware of the fact that they are not necessarily confined. What they are is they are psychologically manipulated, they're blackmailed, they're coerced, they're intimidated, they're threatened to the point that if they speak, they would go into an anxiety or panic attack if they talk about what is happening to them because they're so scared to, dis to disclose what is happening to them because they have been threatened, their loved ones have been threatened. Something has put them in that state of mind where they cannot talk about what is happening to them. And so they don't need to be tied up to a radiator or behind closed locked doors they can move about and just stay nice and silent, just like the trafficker would want them to be. Finally, um, we also tend to think about trafficking involving transport across a country border. And while the term trafficking does elicit um, some images of transportation and movement across a border, that is not the case. Um, there's also a, a bit of conflation around human smuggling and human trafficking, where smuggling involves um, someone voluntarily seeking out assistance to cross a border. However, the fact that they voluntarily sought out assistance to cross a border doesn't mean that that journey cannot end in trafficking. And if on arrival to their destination, they are then not allowed to freely move about and they are exploited for profit, either in labor or commercial sex, um, that is considered trafficking and they do have rights in this country. So I just want to point that out. It also doesn't even involve 
crossing of city lines or state lines or even neighborhood lines. We all have um, probably heard of cases where a child is trafficked right out of their home by their biological parents or their foster parents or their legal guardian, trafficked right out of their home without ever having to cross even a neighborhood line. So that transportation bit is something that um, we need to kind of erase from, um, from how we think about trafficking. And then it doesn't always involve organized crime networks. As I mentioned, family um, can be the trafficker, an employer can be the trafficker, um, and it doesn't have to be a gang or a mafia um, to be considered trafficking. Some of the other misconceptions um, specifically related to sex trafficking um, are that there is no relationship between a child who is in the foster care system or in the social service system and trafficking. And what research has shown, the data seems to suggest that about 25% of minors who are trafficked are in the care of foster services or social services at the time that they are trafficked. So just because they have a um, home to go to or guardians to, um, that, that uh, purportedly look after them doesn't mean that they cannot be trafficked. Um, it, there's also a misconception about what um, the trafficked person might look like. And we tend to think of um, trafficking as being related to poverty and being related to disadvantages. And while that is very true, structural disadvantages and poverty leave people at greater risk of being trafficked. We do have many um, survivors of trafficking who came from educated and affluent families and found themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time, perhaps making not the best decision, um, but it is possible. And so we have to not really sort of pigeon our image of what a trafficking, uh, a trafficked person looks like. And then finally, as it pertains to sex trafficking, it's not just females who are trafficked. Every um, research study that has been done uh, on this topic, um, every survey that has looked at this, even from the US Department of Justice uh, work, has shown that there is a percentage of other genders that are being trafficked in this country. And Polaris has recently started to also try to look at non-binary genders. We always tend to think of male, female, um, but we need to really assess this um, problem and how much it extends into um, other gender identities. With relation to labor trafficking, we tend to think of this as not of impacting children. There's been data that shows that six to 10% of children are labor trafficked here in the United States. Some of them are US citizens, some of them are immigrant children, but nonetheless, they are being trafficked in the labor, in, in a labor industry. And finally, we tend to kind of think of labor trafficking as something that would not involve um, sexual exploitation or sexual abuse or sexual violence. And yet we find that in many cases of labor trafficking, there is also some sexual abuse or violence or concomitant um, sex trafficking that um, happens. Um, here in the Boston area, there was a very, um, a six year ring, a very um, prominent case that was uh, finally uh, broken. And it involved the movement of Asian women from New York City into Boston through South Station Terminal, our bus station. Um, and then the movement of those women to massage parlors and nail salons. And they were both labor and sex trafficked in those industries. And then finally, um, we um, don't always recognize the overlap between human trafficking and the opioid epidemic. <clears throat> and it's really important uh, to understand why there's a, an overlap in these, um, in these two entities. They're not separate. There is a, there is a, 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 a number, there are a number of traffic, trafficking survivors who report having used substances while being trafficked. And it was either that they were using substances be, to cope with what they were going through to deal with the trauma that they were experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis or substances that were forced on them. There was one study that reported 28% of those who were surveyed reported having been forced to use substances when um, they were being trafficked. And again, this is to keep the, tr the trafficked person complacent, um, keeping them kind of foggy and just um, 
following the instructions of the trafficker at all times. And 26% in that survey reporting having had reported having overdosed um, while being trafficked. So lastly, and again, um, uh, we heard a little bit about this in the previous talk, LGBTQ youth are extremely vulnerable. It's important for us to understand that LGBTQ youth account for about five to 10% of the total youth in the United States. And yet despite only accounting for five to 10%, they are overrepresented and disproportionately impacted by homelessness. 40% of our youth here in the United States are identify as LGBTQ+. LGBTQ youth are 120 times more likely to become homelessness because of family rejection or abuse, because they're either thrown out of their home or they run away from home um, out of fear and, uh, and shame or because they're being abused. Um, and this is an important thing to, to understand. Once a child is homeless, they are at risk of sexual violence on the streets. LGBTQ youth report 59% of them will report sexual violence as compared to 33% of non-LGBTQ youth um, reporting sexual violence while on the streets. And finally, there is some data showing that about 25% of youth who are trafficked here in the United States identify as LGBTQ. So really important to be cognizant of our patients and, um, and their um, vulnerabilities. And um, finally, a few more misconceptions that I do want to touch upon. Um, why the, I've heard people say, well, why do they stay? Why do they not just leave? Why don't they tell someone and just get help? They come into the healthcare system. They come into contact with a healthcare provider. It's a great moment to say, to talk about what's happening to them. Why don't they do that? And um, what I would say is that the extreme fear that they live in, under threats of harm to themselves, to others, under threats of deportation, under threats of getting the police involved um, in the course of being trafficked. Um, sometimes uh, people are forced to commit crimes themselves and may be scared of the police. There are so many things that they're contending with, but only the person who is trafficked really understands how threatening um, and how dangerous their trafficker is. They understand how, what kinds of threats the trafficker has made and how likely the trafficker is to, um, to uh, come through with their promises of harm. And so you've heard it probably said that an intimate partner violence, um, the person who is being abused, it takes about seven to nine times before they leave the intimate, the, the, um, the abuser. Well, it's kind of the same thing. It's the, it's the fear, it's a threat. It's also the fact that they're living in chronic stress and chronic stress has significant physiological effects on our bodies and on our brains. For one, it changes the function and it changes the volume of our prefrontal cortex. We need the prefrontal cortex to make informed decisions, to learn from our experiences and to plan. It's important in, exe in, in executive function in order to be forward thinking, in order to make decisions and carry out tasks. And when that prefrontal cortex is bombarded with negative hormones, that makes it hard for um, someone who is going through chronic trauma to be able to make the types of decisions that are needed um, to feel safe um, leaving a situation, to plan how to leave a situation and to do so in a way that will be safe. So it's really important to remember that, um, you know, they, it's not that they want to stay. It's that it's, they haven't figured out how to leave quite yet. But if you support them and you give them time, you do safety planning, you talk them through what their fears are, whatever they're willing to share with you without forcing more than they're willing to share, um, that's how you can be helpful to your patients. They don't want or need to be saved. There's no such thing as us saving another human being. They really do the hard work themselves and they save themselves. And all we can do is be there and support them. And um, lastly, all traffickers are not males. Females can traffic other humans. And it's important not to have in our mind um, that it can only be a male. If our patient presents to an emergency department with an adult female, 
it do, and calls her the aunt or the mother, well, it very well might be. But don't be fooled to think that that could not be a trafficker or an associate of a trafficker. And then finally, all survivors, uh, uh, not all survivors see themselves as victims or consider themselves victims. Being able to think of yourself as someone who is strong and in control to the extent that you're able to be in control is sometimes what actually helps you survive the trauma, right? So it's really hard to concede and to say, yes, I'm a, um, I've been victimized in this horrific way. Um, sometimes it takes time to get to the point where you can contend it's a very complex situation and the survivor can contend with what they went through, the decisions that they made and how that led to their, um, to, to their situation. And so with that, I will like to turn it back to Dr. Staklosa to um, take over um, the next session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Macias Constantopoulos. And you laid down so much knowledge in that um, period of time with so many statistics. I tried to share some links to some of the studies that you um, were referencing, but feel free to, to fill in more in the chat so folks can um, access that, that information. So um, also to highlight in the chat that for those that are on social media and Twitter, we do have a hashtag for this event. It's hashtag have hope and I included um, Dr. Macias's uh, Twitter handle and uh, two of the organizational handles there. Um, just trying to multitask in the midst of all this. So um, I'm very pleased to introduce two members of the advisory council for our joint AHA Heal Jones Day work on trafficking, um, Ingrid Johnson, as well as Diana Staris. And um, Ingrid is a manager of patient access at Overlook Medical Center a member of the Atlantic Health System and a mother of a survivor and member of the New Jersey Coalition Against Human Trafficking and the AHA. And Diana has led the Injury Prevention Program and Safe Kids Middlesex County Coalition at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospitals Level One Trauma Center in New Brunswick, New Jersey since October 2003. So a wealth of knowledge here and pleased to hand it over for Human Trafficking 101. Thank you so much. Hello everyone. Again, my name is Ingrid. So um, I'll tell you first, I'm a mom, but second, I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for over 20 years. I have experiences working in our emergency departments, critical care uh, in our communities with homeless health care. And so I didn't know why I had gallivanted all around to accumulate that level of experience, including behavior health. But then eventually my daughter went missing for 11 months. And that's what brings me to the table with you today from a mother's perspective. I didn't know anything about human trafficking other than the myths that we just dispelled a few minutes ago. And so in 2005, my daughter was missing. And so she was missing for 11 months. She was 13 years old. She made one phone call. She escaped in neighboring New York to a gas station bathroom. And I missed the call giving report to the fellow nurses in the morning. And I got in the hallway of that hospital and played the message that said, mommy, I missed you. Mommy, I love you. And that was it. I went to the police station to again report the contact and it still took months before my daughter was recovered. I continued to work every night as a nurse hoping that someone was taking care of my child though the way that I was taking care of my patients. And so I just wanna to add to the conversation today that we should never give up. And that today is part of a bigger dream for me, a dream for a better tomorrow in which we as healthcare folks in the community join together to save lives on a different level. So I'm really appreciative for the opportunity. Um, as a member of Atlantic Health System, we believe in building a trusted network of caring. As a nurse, my nursing education told me that I needed to build trusting relationships with my patients. And so Jose, I hear you. I hear survivors and victims alike that we need to take that serious, that we're here to be trusted and to build trusting relationships. So that's my introduction to who I am and why I'm here with you today. Uh, we also uh, like to refer you to what's on the screen or, or in the chat, 
which will be the red flags that are posted by the American Hospital Association on the website. And these things are highly important. Don't take them for granted because maybe they're somewhat familiar to you, but we ask that you look at the red flags from a different lens. Now that you're becoming informed and we're raising your awareness beyond what it was before you joined us today. So the clinical presentation, you should understand what it means now when the oral history just doesn't match up. What about inconspicuous brandings on people's bodies? Those brandings don't say, mommy, I love you. They're barcoded at times in the inner lip, in the inner thighs. So there are ways that you can become more informed within your organizations to what we are really discussing here. You know, there's concern about being jailed. They don't know where they are. You ask someone of the right age, where do you live? And they can't answer. Or they just look to the other person that's with them for the answers. You have a gut instinct. And that's what I really love about healthcare, that it's my assessment skills. It's that gut instinct that helped me to find my daughter. And yes, you know, it's a lot of work to have to be done as a survivor. But as a mom, I utilize law enforcement. I was in my car. I kept the same phone number, the same home, the same car. And I was with police and undercover vehicles at a train station in the middle of New York in a place I had never been with my family ever, waiting for my daughter. And hours later, after I had given up many times, she appeared. And she appeared after they told me she wouldn't look like my photo that I had presented, but underneath a wig, underneath the clothing that somebody else provided for her was my daughter. And so I'm very passionate about this subject. And I really am hopeful that after you leave here today, after our HT 101 segment with Diana and I, that you will do something and join us in doing even one thing, one thing to improve the lives of another human being. That's what we're hopeful for today. So now I'm gonna jump right on in and tell you about some extensive research that shows and talks about why survivors don't self-identify. They don't see themselves as victims. They've been promised a lot for false love. There are threats of jail. My daughter had been jailed, still missing in a database. Imagine that. Your mother's looking for you and you're 13 and you're jailed and released to somebody else. There's threats of violence. Those folks threaten my family. They feel shamed and they definitely feel that no one would understand. Now, I wouldn't have understood, but I was met on street corners by myself posting flyers. And hours after posting flyers of your missing kid, you come to a whole different level of comprehension and understanding of what it means to fight for your life, what it means to fight on behalf of somebody else. And so that's what this is to me, a fight. You know, she couldn't trust the authorities because the authorities were buying sex as well. And so shelter, money, food, all these things, you know, they convinced my daughter that she couldn't come home until she was 18 because nobody would want her and no one would love her. And that's what people are doing. They're tricking people. They're preying on the vulnerable. And people just got to get this. You ask, why don't they self-reveal? Because they're scared. They've been convinced that it's not safe to talk to any of us in uniform. And that's just the way it is. And so the initiatives that we're doing at my institution, at Atlantic Health Systems, I'm at Overlook Medical Center in New Jersey. We have a pilot with our emergency department and there we've formed our own um, committee. And our committee is full of members from our multidisciplinary team, which include our physicians, our nurses, case management, social workers, security, and someone from our patient experience team. You see, this affects everyone. Everyone within your organization should be able to identify red flags and refer them to the proper persons to take over and, and talk about next steps. And so that committee has met since um, 2020, February 2020. 
And we now have had a meeting with the ED chairs of all five of our hospitals because everybody wants to be active in the fight against human trafficking. Our committee created banners with our community partners, the New Jersey American Academy against, uh, I'm sorry, New Jersey American Academy of Pediatrics and our New Jersey Coalition Against Human Trafficking. And that banner is posted in our waiting areas of our two emergency departments. And it signifies not just to our patients that are coming in, that we are here working in the fight against human trafficking, but it signifies to all of our employees that they too are part of this fight. Now we're working on our next steps and next steps should be guided towards the development of a human trafficking uh, program, a protocol to fight against this God awful situation, a response team. And so you need a champion. So I am so grateful to our president of our system, Brian Granulati, that serves as our champion. And then under him is our key leadership within our hospitals, our presidents, our chief nursing officers, and the leaders in our emergency department. There's typically, there's been no one who said no. Everyone is on board. And so don't be afraid to be that cheerleader because maybe you're the first to be here today. Maybe you need to go to someone who you work closely with, who's in leadership, to ask about maybe forming a committee to take a deeper dive look at what's going on in the fight against human trafficking. And so understand your community resources. That's important because if you do identify someone, you want to understand how can you help them? Jose talked about that help. It may not be what you think, so it's worth the discussion. And then the last thing I'll say is that we need to identify the steps in the journey to increase our organization's awareness. It doesn't stop. This is an ongoing discussion. And so I am now going to turn it over to Diana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ingrid. So um, as mentioned, I work at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in New Brunswick, and we are part of a bigger system, Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health across uh, the state of New Jersey. And um, what I'd like to talk a little bit about for our, for our purposes, that HT 101 is really how do you start all of this? And I will tell you that I got involved with um, human trafficking prevention back in 2013, right before we were getting ready to host the Super Bowl. And that's really when I first started hearing about this and started learning more about it. And I was with a colleague at a presentation and I said, you know what, we really need to bring this back to the hospital because everybody in our hospital should know what this is. Um, so we started a committee and that committee did a lot of work in the community and in the hospital to educate our staff and educate our community and our partners. But again, as Ingrid said, you need a champion. And I will tell you that the champion changed over the years because people leave and then you have to find a new champion. And so when Ingrid talks about never giving up, I say the same thing, but speaking from a different perspective that, you know, we didn't give up. And so um, over the years, as I said, lots has changed, but what we really found was that we now have a group of leaders who think that this is an important topic and believe in educating our staff. And I think that's really, really, really important. You have to have that support from leadership where this doesn't go anywhere. Um, and I would tell you that it's, you know, we started with a small committee where now we now have a committee at the corporate level. So um, it involves all of the facilities that are part of RWJ Barnabas Health. We have a plan for education where we are, um, we're first doing a baseline knowledge survey of all of our staff across the board in all our facilities to see what do people know, where are those gaps so that we can address the education to, to, to those gaps. And really, when I say everyone, I really do mean everyone, because it could be somebody from patient transport that notices something or hears something. And if they don't know where to go with that, um, you know, or they don't recognize it as being a red flag, then it's really, you know, it's going to fall off to the wayside and nobody will be able to help that person. So everyone needs to learn the basics of what is human trafficking, 
what are those red flags that you might see in a potential victim? And then if you recognize that, what do you do? So looking at policies and procedures that are already on your books, I will tell you that as far advanced as we are right now, we're still referring to child abuse and neglect policies and adult violence policies, because that's what we have to work with. And all hospitals have those. So you know you have that basis, right? So important to know what those policies are in your hospital and what the processes are behind those policies. Um, I told you we're doing a baseline knowledge survey. Well, then we're going to be rolling out a, you know, using our e-learning system, we're going to be rolling out a PowerPoint. Um, we are really looking to be able to have this provided in English and Spanish. So for those folks who work with us who English is not their first language, they will still find it easily accessible. Um, and then really looking at what comes next after that and doing that direct education with departments that really need to hear that's more in depth, that HT201. And, you know, when we talk about that, I really want to mention that you'll be learning in the next session about a tool called the PAIR tool, which helps clinicians, not just clinicians, helps, helps people to uh, be able to have a discussion with a potential victim in a trauma-informed approach, a patient-centered approach so that you can start developing that relationship so that even though they may not want to, maybe they don't self-identify at first, they know that they are in a safe place and that they can come back to that safe place and be able to um, maybe get the help that they finally are ready to receive. Um, definitely, you know, I think it's important also not not to just think of yourself as a healthcare provider. Yes, we all are, but also you are members of a community. You might belong to a faith-based organization. You might help to run a scouting organization. You might um, be involved with Rotary or some other civic organization. And those are all avenues for you to be sharing this information because the more people who are aware and understand what human trafficking is and what those red flags are, the more we can help to prevent it in the first place. And I think it's really important to think about what your spheres of influence are. Who do you come in contact with on a regular basis that you can be helping to educate and helping to understand what those red flags might be? Um, really super, super important. Um, you know, one of the very simple things that we talk about is um, fair trade items and purchasing fair trade items. And that means that that item was made under fair conditions and that the people who made it were paid fair wages. There are a lot of products out there that are not fair trade, but two that I'm sure everybody on this call partake in are coffee and chocolate. And if we all bought fair trade coffee and chocolate, imagine the amount of labor trafficking um, we could definitely, we could be cutting back on. That's super important. Putting the national hotline phone number, which I don't believe has gotten mentioned here yet, but hopefully our illustrator will get it up on our board here. That number, I'm going to say it to you because you should have it in your phone. It's a great resource for everybody is 888 373 Eight, eight. And it's a 24 seven hotline, not only for reporting, but for getting information. So if you're not sure what's going on, but you've got this gut feeling, you can call, you can tell them what's happening and they can help to direct you. And if you prefer texting, as many of our younger folks do, you can text um, to the word be free, 233-733 and just put in info or help and uh, they will, they're there to get back to you immediately. So that's, a, that's definitely your first line of, you know, what can I do if I'm in the community um, to figure out that, you know, <laughs> we're, we're, you know, we may have a situation in front of us. And then In Ingrid and I didn't really get a chance to talk about this, but just real quickly, we both belong to the New Jersey Coalition Against Human Trafficking. And that's where we actually met um, many years ago now. Um, and I encourage you to get involved with, if this is something that you know has hit you in the heart, go get involved with a group in your area. Um, we are a group of volunteers and um, we provide education in the community and we have a healthcare committee that Ingrid and I sit on and we 
reach out to healthcare providers all the time with, right now it's virtual education, but hopefully we'll get back in person soon. Um, but we really reach so many different groups from medical and nursing students to um, you know, social workers and case managers and physicians and nurses and everybody in between. So we encourage you to join a group in your area, learn more. Um, I believe the website for the coalition was put into the chat at safernj.org. Go there and learn more, um, not just about our coalition, but just about human trafficking in general and what are the resources out there that um, might help you to be better informed. Um, and I think that's really key. Learn as much as you can and share the information, not just with your colleagues at work, but with everybody that you know. And with that, I will introduce the next speaker. And thanks for letting us be here and talk to you. And for next is Holly Gibbs from Community um, no, sorry, Common Spirit. Hi, uh, Holly Gibbs here uh, from Common Spirit Health. Common Spirit Health is a um, national healthcare system comprised of two member organizations. One is Catholic Health Initiatives or CHI and the other is Dignity Health. Um, so CHI and Dignity Health aligned in early 2019 to form Common Spirit Health. As the director of the Human Trafficking Response Program, I'm so honored to be a part of such an amazing panel of speakers and pioneers in the anti-trafficking space, um, addressing how healthcare can get involved. Um, so in my role as the director of Human Trafficking Response at Common Spirit, I have debriefed with staff, um, physicians, nurses, social workers, chaplains, um, and other clinicians on many cases involving patients possibly impacted by human trafficking or other types of violence. And um, all the learnings that we gleaned from these debriefings shaped what we now call our internal policy. This is a system-wide policy. Um, and I wanna share two key learnings. We, we've had many learnings from these debriefings, but one key learning is that red flags for human trafficking or any other type of violence are not necessarily going to be seen in triage. So when we first started this program at Dignity Health, we developed our victim response procedures with the assumption that red flags would be seen by nurses in triage. And we learned that um, red flags can be missed in triage and can be observed at any point along the care process. So something to keep in mind as others begin to develop their own policy. Um, another key learning for us was that it did not work well for staff or patients to have a policy or procedure focused on human trafficking. Patients are presenting with uh, red flags of various types of violence, right? So if someone's presenting with a controlling companion, whether it's a, um, a partner or a family member, it could be sex trafficking, labor trafficking, domestic violence, or even another type of violence. At Dignity Health, we even had um, a case of a, a patient presenting with red flags of um, being in an exploitative or predatory cult. So something to keep in mind, um, if we have policies in place that are specific to one type of violence, we put our health professionals in a position where they have to investigate. They have to ask questions which could further traumatize a patient in order to determine which policy or procedure to grab. And that can be very challenging when you're trying to provide patient care in a hectic environment like the emergency department, say in the middle of the night on a Friday or a Saturday. Um, and it's at those times you may have limited support from other staff. So with those um, learnings, um, we developed an abuse, neglect, and violence policy. So our policy at Common Spirit addresses all types of violence, at those types of violence that impact our patient population or could impact our patient population. Um, and so I wanna talk to you about a key component of that policy and it's called the PEAR tool. 
So I am going to share my screen. Um, I, the, out, an example of our clinical abuse, neglect and violence policy is available on our website and I'll share links after I'm done. Um, and the PAIR tool, a key component to that policy is also available online. Um, so we'll share a link to that as well. This tool, the PAIR tool is um, based on uh, something called the Q's model from Futures Without Violence. So Futures Without Violence created this model called Q's, C-U-E-S, um, which promotes universal education to all patients about domestic violence and the health effects from violent relationships. Um, so we pulled from that model and we simply apply it to all types of violence. This universal education approach is key to the pair steps. And um, the, the, another big difference um, between pair and cues is that we developed pair to have action steps. We have learned that nurses want to know what to do um, in the moment, tell me what to do, give me five steps, that's easier to work with than, um, than these concepts of confidentiality, universal education and support and services. So um, we developed the PAIR tool with HEAL Trafficking and Pacific Survivor Center, which is a, an agency in Honolulu, I believe they provide support and services to victims of violence. And um, it's meant to guide health professionals on how to provide trauma-informed victim assistance to patients. So again, you are not looking at the abuse, neglect, and violence policy here. You're looking at a key component that describes how to walk into a room and talk to a patient about whichever types of violence are of concern. And it's rooted in a universal education approach. A universal education approach is... Um, prioritizing a normalizing and non-judgmental conversation with your patients um, prior to or in lieu of screening patients with questions. Um, so I wanna point out here, there's a double asterisk sprinkled throughout these steps. The double asterisk indicates points at which this conversation may come to an end. And that can happen at any time for any reason. In fact, you may not even be able to begin a conversation with a patient because it may not be safe to do so. There may be a controlling companion present who is not willing to leave the room. So the double asterisk indicates next steps to, if I'm pointing to the bottom of, this, of the page here, report safety concerns to appropriate personnel, Come follow through on mandated reporting if mandated reporting applies, and then continue trauma-informed health services. Whenever possible, schedule follow-up appointments to continue building rapport with the patient and to monitor the patient's health, safety, and well-being. Sorry, I'm moving little things around that's blocking my view. Um, so something else I want to point out before I go through the steps is this tool is meant to be used um, with the knowledge that a victim or survivor of human trafficking or any other type of violence can present to a healthcare setting at any point along the, the process or um, experience of, of violence. So the person may be vulnerable to violence, they may be actively experiencing violence, or they may be days, months, or even years past the traumatic experience or violent experience, and the trauma from that experience is still influencing their health and well-being. So the idea of educating people about different types of violence and what resources are available to them can support prevention, intervention, and long-term health and well-being. So the five steps are to provide privacy, educate, ask, respect, and respond. So if possible, provide a safe and private setting, ideally a private room with closed doors, but we, re we realize that's not always uh, possible in, a, in, a, in an emergency department, so as private as possible. If the companion refuses to be separated, this could be an indicator of violence. It doesn't necessarily mean that it is. Um, every situation is going to be different. 
One key component of our education at Common Spirit Health is an introduction to trauma um, and trauma-informed approaches to care because there, you can't control or predict all the variables that can occur when patients present to a healthcare setting and they're, they're, they're suspected to be a possible victim of violence. You just, you just don't know or you can't predict everything that's gonna happen. But if staff are educated on trauma and how to recognize trauma and respond in meaningful ways, then they are more likely to create a patient-centered experience and less likely to traumatize or re-traumatize a patient. So there's maybe a lot happening in between the lines here. So if the companion refuses to be separated, it may be an indicator of abuse. It may be time to end the, um, the conversation. Otherwise, try to come up with strategies to speak with the patient alone. Um, this applies to virtual or telephonic visits, right? Request that the patient move to a private space, but assume that the person may not be alone. Um, companions are never appropriate interpreters, regardless of communication abilities. Um, if the patient indicates preference to use a companion as an interpreter, it may not be safe to continue with the conversation. Refer to your policies and procedures. And another key component to ensuring privacy is is explaining limits to confidentiality. You health professionals are mandated reporters. So at, one, at what point might this conversation have to leave the room? Um, so empower your patient with knowledge and knowledge of limits. The next step is to educate. Educate the patient in a non-judgmental manner. Um, so there's some example statements in here which you can use or you can um, customize them according to your own voice. I educate all of my patients about, say, human trafficking and domestic violence because violence is common and it has a big impact on our health and well being. Ideally, use a brochure or safety card to review information. This can reduce the tension in the room and further normalize the conversation. So you can take the, the focus off of yourself and the patient and place it on the brochure that you're reviewing. And ideally this brochure is gonna have information about resources, whether it's national or local resources. Um, and uh, we recommend um, offering the brochure or other informational materials to your patient and say it in a way as in case this is ever an issue for you or someone you know. Um, do you wanna take this resource? That enables the patient to accept resources without disclosing what's going on, if something is going on. Um, and if it feels appropriate to continue the conversation, and especially if uh, you are still concerned about the person's well-being, then you wanna directly ask about concerns. Um, if you're in a non-acute care setting that where you have the extra time, you can ask, is there anything you'd like to share with me? Um, but if you're, if you're out of time and you're seeing concerns or there's indicators of victimization, directly ask. And an example statement is, I've noticed, and then say what you've noticed. I've noticed, you know, your boyfriend wasn't willing to leave the room right away. And I see these tattoos and I see these bruises. I'm worried about your safety. You don't have to share details with me, but I want to connect you with resources if you're in need of assistance. And then the final steps are to respect and respond, respecting the person where they are at, respecting their decisions to disclose or not disclose or uh, their choices to accept assistance or not. Um, you wanna meet them where they're at and respect their wishes even if you don't agree with them. That does not mean that you don't then follow through on mandated reporting. So um, if the patient denies victimization or declines assistance, uh, respect their wishes. If you have concerns about their safety, offer them a hotline card or a safety card that has some key information on a smaller piece of um, material uh, uh, that can assist in the event of an emergency. Otherwise, if they do accept assistance, if at all possible, please arrange for a warm referral, meaning a personal introduction to the local agency or advocate that can support the patient moving forward in the community. There's some uh, national hotlines offered here. So if you're in a community with limited resources, you can always arrange for a private setting and support a patient with contacting a national hotline. And then again, um, if it hasn't been done yet, report safety concerns to appropriate personnel, complete mandated reporting, and by all means, continue the medical care that this person is seeking in a trauma-informed manner. 
So the PAIR tool is a three-page handout that summarizes the PAIR steps. It summarizes risk factors, indicators, and resources for various types of violence on page two. And then on page three, uh, it summarizes um, or it includes some uh, national victim assistance hotlines and it includes an editable space to add information about your local agencies and a note section to describe some specifics about those, those agencies. What populations do they serve? What hours are they available? Which ones will arrive on site to meet with my patient and support staff? So that's, a, that's an overview of the PAIR tool. I'm so grateful for the partnership with HEAL Trafficking and Pacific Survivor Center to create this tool. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Dr. Hani Staklosa. Thanks so much. I'm loving these illustrations. So many resources shared, and um, the pair tool is just really the 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 most trauma informed, most logical way of integrating all of these approaches. Um, and I think uh, Laura will also be spotlighted here. Beautiful. Okay, kicking it over to you, Laura. You're on mute. Of course, that would happen, right? Um, thank you all for joining us today. I'm, I'm just so delighted um, to be with you all today and to share such a special program. Um, just a little background, this is the last installment of a three-part virtual series, uh, which, as we mentioned earlier, our Human Trafficking Advisory Council uh, informed and, and really has been key to developing such rich content for, to share with you all. And just quickly, we started with the C-suite convening where we really trying to learn how to engage leadership. We then engage program and clinical leadership to try to understand uh, what tools were still needed, any challenges or gaps. And finally, this event. Uh, so let me just give you the context as to how we developed um, these sessions. We heard from all of you that you know, there's great resources out there. We just really needed to bring it to a very high level. We wanted to create a foundation for all healthcare professionals. So hopefully through learning from uh, some of the common misconceptions and going through a wonderful presentation about the 101, so inspiring, thank you Ingrid and Diana, um, to really learning about some of those tactical tools from Holly who did a phenomenal job of talking us through that. Um, so, you know, absolutely, um, you know, this was with you in mind. So this roadmap is to hopefully give you the one, two, threes of how to start looking at developing a response program. Let me start by sharing that through our registration, we were told um, there was over 400 registrants that 46% already had a program and 54% did not have a human trafficking response program. So I just wanna share that information so you can scan the field. It's great information for us to understand, but I think um, Diana did a great job at explaining her story about how her program got started. She learned about it, about a large uh, sporting event. She started asking questions, developing a committee, and there she got started. So I just wanna start with the first step, understanding your community and local needs. And I think, again, Diana's story really reflects on how you can start looking around, really trying to understand and ask those questions. Uh, we have some great resources that are gonna get um, added to the chat box here as to what organizations you can refer to that can help you figure out how to get started from the National Survivor Network, Survivor Alliance, um, uh, different US state and territory profiles. And those, those links will be provided for you so you can start looking at some of that data. It really starts with the conversation, asking questions and looking at that assessment of your community. And I think we do that already. So, um, I, you know, again, everybody is in a different place in a different context and everything's gonna look a little bit different but asking those questions are key. I just wanna focus on the next step which is really engaging stakeholders and survivors. When we're talking about outside, external. And this is so important. We get questions about this all the time. Who do I ask? Where do I go? And I think, again, uh, in, in HC 101, you heard 
but there's plenty of, of, of work happening around us. It's just a matter of connecting, whether it's through law enforcement, community-based organizations. There's a lot of local coalitions or, or state task forces. So just do a quick search, um, see what's around in your local community who's already looking and, and working in this space, uh, engage with them. Uh, I think you know, it's, it is very important to keep survivors in front of all of the work that we do. So uh, some of the organizations that we mentioned can help connect in your local community to, to survivors. Because um, thank you, Jose, for sharing your story. It, it really continues to expand your understanding and, and through that, uh, improve your patient care. We also want to just point out, don't forget about labor trafficking. I think our, our speakers, you know, the nation's experts have done a great job at, at talking about um, labor trafficking. And, you know, we need to make sure that we're looking at this and thinking about the different populations that may be at risk. And, and Jose shared a lot of vulnerabilities and some of the vulnerable populations, but we need to think about migrants, uh, sorry, migrants, as well as uh, those asylum seekers. And even though it's not all foreign, um, we wanna make sure that we're thinking through different labor trafficking situations. So if you have questions about how to be survivor informed, we're gonna add a great resource from NITAC um, that helps us really try to understand how to be survivor informed in our practice. So our third step, leadership buy-in. I think you heard it throughout our presentations. This is so key, so important. I wanna highlight a profile that we did on Atlantic Health System. You heard Ingrid's very inspiring story and she continuously inspires me to do this work. And this profile, shares the story of Ingrid and her CEO and how she was able to connect and really continue to foster that relationship and that support. And again, how you go about getting the leadership buy-in, it's really unique to your situation. But again, starts by asking questions. And sometimes don't forget that the connection to this work is truly personal. So whether it's starting at the very top or at the very bottom, it's our jobs really truly to make that connection. And I think a lot of folks think of this work of getting leadership buying as making that business case. So making sure that you share the stats, as Diana mentioned, make sure you share this information with everybody, not just your colleagues. And final step for, uh, for me before I hand it off to uh, Hani is develop a team, identify champions. This is a work that doesn't take one person, it takes everybody. And this is about looking at the different levels, right? And everybody mentioned, don't forget, the environmental staff, don't forget clerical staff. So think about the, your workforce as part of your team. Think about the different levels, whether it's leadership or governance and how you can keep them informed of the work. I know Diana mentioned that now that there's a committee that has developed all the way to their leadership, as well as some of the committees that work on the policies and the procedures. So with that, I wanna hand it over to Polly I mean, sorry, Hani, who's going to get more specific, specific at policies and procedures. Thank Hani? you so much, Laura. And Holly would be great at speaking <laughs> to this as well. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be covering uh, creating policies and procedures, education and training, monitoring and evaluation, and ongoing implementation in 30 seconds. Just kidding. Um, but um, what, what I'm going to be sharing here is very much echoing what we've been hearing throughout the program today. So none of this is really going to be new information. I just want to make sure that you have resources to go to, and I want to highlight some key points. And I, I do want to acknowledge that stat that Laura mentioned from the top. We know that many of you are in health systems that have response programs in place. So as you're listening, um, think about how those response programs can be more inclusive of types of trafficking exploitation or more inclusive across genders, orientation, races, ethnicities, or the staff that's being trained. Um, so look for those opportunities to improve the existing efforts as you're listening in. And for those that don't have a program, think about what your role as a champion on this issue really could look like and where do you feel like you can get started? So a wise person once said, failing to plan is planning to fail. Now, depending on how you Google that uh, quote, you'll either find that it's attributed to Benjamin Franklin or to Winston Churchill. 
uh, maybe someday somebody will attribute it to me because clearly it's not, um, it's just a truism, right? We intuitively know that truth that being proactive rather than reactive to those vulnerable to trafficking and those who have experienced trafficking who, comes, who come through our doors is really critical. But why exactly? beyond it being intuitive. So a couple of reasons. Health professionals, whether consciously or unconsciously, will avoid diagnosing something they don't have a plan for. Also, as we've heard from some of our speakers today, there is a potential for real harm to come to those who've experienced trafficking if policies aren't in place. As CEO of Heal Trafficking, I have this bird's eye view of healthcare responses across the globe. And I'm constantly reviewing the latest research studies. And sadly, there are simply too many stories of times where traffic persons are re-traumatized by their healthcare experiences. Also, we heard from Ingrid, what many health professionals don't realize is that some folks who've experienced trafficking have been forced to commit crimes as part of their exploitation or are told by their trafficker that they'll go to jail. Um, if they tell anybody. So a well-intentioned health professional calling law enforcement against a patient's wishes or the wrong law enforcement at the wrong time can result in arrest or deportation or other forms of, of harm to that victim of trafficking. I also want to flag, I don't know how many folks are listening in from New York State, but in New York State, hospitals are mandated to have policies and procedures for trafficking. So it's required. When setting up response plans, there are a few resources I want to essentially re-highlight because they've been spoken of here. Um, so the HEAL Trafficking Protocol Toolkit, which is being used in 35 countries around the globe, is really that A to Z roadmap. Um, Dignity Health, now Common Spirit Health's shared learnings manual, as well as abuse policy. And I know that Holly shared her inf contact information in the chat. Um, and there was also a link earlier for one of those as well as the Department of Health and Human Services SOAR for organizations. So there's a individual SOAR, which I'll talk about later, um, but SOAR for organizations really can provide technical assistance for policy um, uh, integration. On the HEAL protocol website, we have a compendium example of protocols from different health systems, including the ones I mentioned, um, as well as state hospital association toolkits. One of those is the Maryland toolkit that was also mentioned in the chat. So you have plenty of resources to reference. There's no reason to, to reinvent the wheel. And um, we recently did an evaluation of the HEAL protocol toolkit, and I'll share a quote from one of the respondents. They said, the HEAL toolkit is valuable because it presents the information I need in an organized fashion. It's helpful to have things presented in a step-by-step -step manner. The toolkit includes a lot of valuable information and suggestions for resources that I had not considered. Um, and so I know we're going to be sharing, um, great, those resources are being shared in the, the chat um, to link to those th things. Um, you guys will have so many resources at the end, but we're really trying to, to weave them into different stages of this, this work so you know what to access when. So where to start? You know, um, my story is very similar to, you know, what Diana described and, and, and what Holly also described as we were looking at my hospital to integrate trafficking response. We first did a step back, really an audit or an assessment to see where were the existing child abuse protocols? Where were the um, adult violence protocols? Um, in, my, in my hospital, we had a separate strangulation and domestic violence protocol. And we used this opportunity to A, refresh what was there already um, because a lot of that information and approaches were not the latest in evidence-based trauma-informed um, care. And then use that opportunity to really integrate trafficking into the approach. Um, as you see um, and heard from, from Holly um, for Common Spirit Health, they've really taken that integrated approach that recognizes operationally, just in real time as a clinician, the, the uh, beginning steps such as the pair tool approach really are common denominators across forms of violence. Um, and then in terms of how our patients experience it as well, it just makes so much sense. I've had so many patients that have had um, an experience of both domestic violence and trafficking. And usually they're more um, comfortable sharing the domestic violence experience. And then later on, we find about, uh, out about other layers of exploitation, including the trafficking. And so if you're only going after one form of exploitation and sort of in that investigative mode, you may actually miss all of the exploitation altogether. 
Um, in terms of what to include in your protocol, I mean, this is going to be customized to your healthcare facility, but some suggested elements from our toolkit include process for identifying patients at risk for trafficking, guidelines for interviewing high risk patients, strategies for interviewing the patient alone, safety considerations, multidisciplinary treatment and referral plans, strategies for working with minor patients, so those under the age of 18, we heard from Holly um, and around limits of confidentiality, strategies for responding to patients who decline assistance, procedures regarding documentation, including ICD codes, guidelines for forensic examination, and procedures for external reporting. So those are just some examples of elements um, that, that you can include in your policies and procedures. So now you're at the stage where that was fast, you've created your policy and procedure, um, and you don't want it to just kind of collect virtual dust, right? Um, key in integrating any policy is education that goes along with it, not just how do you use this policy, but because trafficking is so relatively new on health professional radar, including um, all of the staff in our, our health facilities, they, many, they need basic education. And as we heard from Diana, that looks different for different types of staff. Um, and it may even be in different languages for different types of staff. Some um, pro tips that I'll, I'll mention here is to really embed it in your existing work in terms of strategy. So in Massachusetts, all health professionals who are mandated reporters um, are required to do a child abuse training. So it makes sense to imbue trafficking training into that child abuse um, because it's included under our, our, um, our child abuse law, but that's an opportunity for everyone across the state to make sure that they're getting some amount of trafficking training. And then looking internally within my own hospital, we have a required domestic violence training every year. We don't have a tr required trafficking training yet. Um, and so we initially started with integrating our trafficking training into our domestic violence training and making a broader interpersonal violence training. It's really important to know the legal landscape as you're thinking about these, these opportunities because um, your administrators in your hospital may not know or be up to date in terms of some of the mandates for education and training um, that have been recently rolled out are relatively new. Um, and so the Jones Day state law tool that was mentioned at the top of the program, I think is really a key resource in educating yourself on what are the requirements in my state, not only in terms of what are requirements for education, but also um, for reporting. Design consideration. So I, I talked about making sure that you're training folks according to their role. And so you may have different designs for your training depending on whether someone is that front desk receptionist or security or whether they're a physician because their role is gonna look different. Also consider adult learning principles. Adults do learn differently than, than kids and the way to get information to be like stickier and to really um, change someone's behavior and the way that they approach someone in a trauma-informed way is gonna look different for adults than if you're you know, training a child on that. And so really making sure that your training incorporates adult learning principles. And then standards. So as you're thinking about what your training looks like, make sure you're looking to those places that have national standards on what training should include in terms of design as well as content. And there's a couple that I'll flag here. So the Department of Health and Human Services in collaboration with Heal Trafficking, International Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and NAPNAP just recently released the um, core competencies for health professionals and health systems. So we'll be including a link for that. Um, HEAL has a curriculum assessment tool, which was featured in the US State Department report and was used by the state of Texas in implementing um, in their mandated education and training law. And then finally here, a resource that I just want to flag, I've, uh, it's been alluded to a few times, but SOAR Online um, is available for integration into a number of learning management systems or e-learning. I know every health system kind of refers to these systems differently. My own health system, it's called HealthStream. Um, and it's free and includes continuing education credits for those taking it. So it's an easy uh, resource to be able to point to your health professionals too. And then closing out, I would be remiss to not talk about monitoring and evaluation and ongoing implementation. So this work is a, a, um, it's a dynamic process. And I, I think, you know, Holly's and, and Diana and Ingrid's examples um, really speak to this, how um, it's important to go back to that core team that's working on this work 
and um, constantly be improving in the ways that you're responding to trafficking, that, that growth mindset. Um, and part of that is collecting data and really thinking, what are the outcomes that we want to look at? Um, what is the impact of this protocol? What is the impact that we're hoping to have for this education? And measuring that and, and thinking about what those outcomes are in terms of things that you're interested in, and those might be more patient-centered outcomes, as well as those things that may be more appealing to the C-suite as you're getting administration buy-in. Um, and there are a slew of resources around monitoring and evaluation and QI work and implementation that um, we'll also be sharing in the chat. Um, but I hope, just taking a step back here, um, I hope that this journey and talking through this step-by-step -step approach to building a response program is helpful, not only to those of you who have response programs in place and, and thinking, you know, man, I really, we really should be looking at um, an expanded definition of outcomes, or we really should be looking more at labor trafficking. Um, and for those of you that are in health systems where the, the, you're really starting from scratch, start, take these resources that we've given you today um, and run with them. And as Ingrid said, never give up. So um, back to you, Laura. Thank you so much. This is actually um, outstanding to watch the illustrations. Thank you so much again um, to Matt for, for those wonderful illustrations. So it is my absolute pleasure to hand it over to Mary Beth Kingston. Uh, she's Chief Nursing Officer of Advocate Aurora Health. I also have the absolute pleasure of working with her as she chairs the Hospitals Against Violence Advisory Group. She has been involved in this virtual series and I thought it would be fit uh, for her to kind of walk us through the illustrations, give us some of her insights um, and close out the program. So Mary Beth, I really appreciate you coming in um, and sharing your thoughts. Uh, thank you, Lana, very much. And I, I just wanna, wanna say, first of all, what an inspirational session. Um, I am certainly not an expert in the field, very interested and um, you know just feel passionately about this, but the the commitment, the passion, um, and Jose, the courage, but your willingness to share your story. You said it helps you, but it's helping a lot of other people as well. It's, it's really overwhelming and uh, just, just a great session, but, but not just inspirational, practical. And that's where we wanna get to. I mean, we all, we all know this is an issue, but we wanna, we wanna move to action. So, so let me start just by thanking the speakers. I also wanna thank Matt, gosh, if I had half that talent, the illustrations really brought the information to life. And my role is just to kind of summarize, which is it's gonna be difficult because there's a lot going on. So I'll just try to hit the high points um, and give you any takeaways or insights uh, that we might see there. Uh, the illustrations are on dispelling the misconceptions, uh, looking at human trafficking 101 for healthcare providers, and then also, uh, which I think gives us a nice step-by-step. Step. And yes, there will be a call to action here. We need to share, we need to connect, we need to continue to create awareness and let others know about these tremendous tools and programs that they can um, access. And also we'll be sharing the illustrations. So let's go ahead and get started. Matt, let's pull up our first one here. All right, so the misconceptions. Um, you know, what really struck me is that the, the misconceptions and not recognizing them and helping to change them is an absolute barrier to us to be able to really address this problem. So it's not just, gee, we don't have the right information. It's gonna prevent us from being successful. So the first thing is, um, yeah, no big surprise, it's here, <laughs> it's in the United States. Um, it's, it is our world and we live there. And I think you know, the, the very important message for all of us is it's not always off in some building, but it can be right under our nose. So awareness is really the first, the first step. The second thing that, that I, uh, I mean, this, was, this whole session was just tremendously chock full of information and, and really dispelling uh, these different beliefs, but broadening our definition uh, that it's not only sex, but labor trafficking, and then also dispelling uh, the stereotypes that we have in our mind. Um, you know, uh, it's not just females um, who are trafficked, uh, many, many uh, young men and, and genders. Um, we, and it can impact all socioeconomic groups. And I think that's another thing to remember. This isn't 
it certainly impacts the vulnerable, but it is not just the vulnerable. The statistics on LGBTQ plus populations and their risk, I think was staggering and something that we all need to consider, not just, not just in this context, but just in the, the things that precede that and lead to this group being so vulnerable to this, this issue. And particularly, and it doesn't apply to only LGBTQ, but the issue of homelessness as, as a risk. And so that our antenna obviously should be up with that. Um, the other stereotype was that, that struck me, and I think this is one we don't often think about, is that the traffickers can be female as well. And you know, we tend to have our societal view of the nurturing female, and that can really harm us in this case. And then I would say one of the, one of the other key takeaways here is the fear, threats, intimidation, that, that those, those aspects can be as, as impactful as physical restraints. And so this, you know, blaming the victim as we've done, we do in many instances of violence for not coming forward, um, it, it, it's so critical for us to understand that. And I think the other key thing there is understanding that physiology that was explained so beautifully of how chronic stress, and gosh, if this is not chronic stress, chronic stress, trauma, all of those aspects can truly impact critical thinking um, and understanding, helping, helping others, not just healthcare workers, but society at large understand that I think is really very important. Okay, let's go to the next one, Matt. And I definitely want copies of these. <laughs> so the next thing that we talked about, again, the willingness of people, Ingrid and others, to share their personal stories as well as their professional stories, which is so moving. Um, but looking at how do, we, how do we take this and move it into the healthcare setting? I think if you can see to the, to the left, the one thing that was repeated time and time again is we have to know what the red flags are. We must know, and I won't list them all, but you know that the controlling behavior and hypervigilance, as well as physical um, signs and symptoms, um, we must we must take this on as a healthcare um, uh, industry and as healthcare professionals, and really work to ensure that everyone knows what the red flags are. I also was struck, and I think we mentioned this before, by the never give up, and again that applies to a number of situations. It certainly applies to families and loved ones that we're working with who have relatives that are victims. It applies to the victims of human trafficking, but it also applies to healthcare workers who are working to combat this and to start programs in their own organizations. So never give up. And I think that's a Winston Churchill one, that, that particular one. I don't know about the planning, but that one is uh, for sure. Um, so a couple of things there important to gain the support of leadership. And you know, in many cases, we've heard examples where there are champions that are just coming to the forefront. That's fantastic. That doesn't always happen. And so as professionals who are engaged in this effort, we need to bring forth um, those stories and those statistics um, so that our organizations understand the scope of the problem and help to build that commitment. And that takes courage on the part of healthcare workers as well. Education, again, was repeated many, many times. Um, but I think education, particularly with the red flags, but after that, what are the actions that we're going to take? The other thing that, that really impressed me during these sessions was so many resources. I mean, the resources are there. Um, I will tell you, um, I really enjoyed go, um, you know, the, the review of the PEAR tool. Um, we borrow, uh, in my organization at Advocate Aurora, we borrow liberally on use Common Spirits website because they've been at this a long time. Uh, and this tool will be another tool that we will be adding um, to our toolbox for sure. Another highlight that I, I really found interesting, and I think this is something we should build on in the future, is putting these pieces together. And it was mentioned earlier, but the you know, I didn't put, I didn't necessarily think about the connection between human trafficking. I mean, I, I guess I think about it sometimes, but I, I don't always keep that front of mind that fair trade and human trafficking. And, you know, what we can be doing as human beings, as consumers, 
that can impact this, I think we've got to get that message out there and really help to connect the dots with society at large, including healthcare workers. So that was another good piece. Again, I, I'm going to try to get those resources listed in every one of our organizations on every unit, but the community um, support, the hotline number, the text, and just all of us focusing on the power through groups, the power of action through groups, through coalitions um, was a big takeaway from these sessions. Okay, Matt, we're gonna bring it home. All right, so this I think so helpful to those who are either working, looking to strengthen their programs or building new programs. And my takeaways here are don't reinvent the wheel, number one, and again, looking at those programs and at the many resources, I think, you know, the, the playbook's there. Um, but I also was struck by, you must have a plan. Um, and you've got to have that plan. Um, Lauda started out by talking a little bit about the fact that we need to connect with community resources. And that's knowing your community, engaging the stakeholders, engaging survivors and families of survivors. They're, it's so powerful. And then ensuring that leadership is in place and that you form a team. And then we moved a little bit more to, okay, so what, what do we do with the plan? How do you start? And very important to assess your current state, identify what you have in place and where are there gaps. And then certainly now we have resources at our fingertips to be able to identify things that we can put in to help address those gaps. Education and training, but not just doing the training, really looking at it from a tailored, um, structured, and core competency type of approach. Who needs what and what will benefit? And that, that just helps the people going through the education as well. I mean, I think generic education is good to establish that baseline, really focusing on the needs of each care provider and knowing, knowing your legal requirements. Um, and I think that's something that I don't know that we always focus on, but that's a really key piece. And again, highlighting, and you can see it all through this, the resources that are available um, to everyone. So um, they're just a few key takeaways. I think many of you have jotted those down. We'll be able to see them, um, you know, just through these gorgeous illustrations. And uh, again, many thanks to Matt for sharing that with us. Uh, we are almost out of time. So I wanna thank all of you for being part of today's virtual workshop. All of this great work will be shared and we, we really would like to stay connected. Again, this is powering groups. This is where we, we will get the information, share the best practices and be able to move everyone forward. Um, there is a, a website and we will be posting that for you to stay connected. And we will also be sending out a, a post event survey for you to complete. I just wanna say again, thank you to all of our presenters and the organizers, but also all of you attending um, you're going to make a difference. You already are making a difference in your communities uh, to combat this just so such a pervasive and awful, um, this issue of human trafficking. And so taking the time out of your day to learn more, to help strengthen and build your programs is commendable. And we want to work with you on this journey. Take care and enjoy the rest of your day.